Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. In winter of 1969, in the experimental forest on the campus of Sunny College at Cortland in Cortland County in New York, I was cutting through the college's small managed forest to get to work. It was early evening, but midwinter, so very dark. I was raised in upstate New York and felt comfortable hiking in familiar woods alone at night, even though female, and I knew the trail well. It cut from the main campus near the track and ended in a small corn or wheat field bordering a quiet avenue about 40 to 60 acres away. The night was dark. There was no moon. Yet my way was faintly lit by starlight reflecting on about six inches of old snow. About a third of the way through the woods, I became aware of the sounds of twigs breaking behind me and to my left about twenty yards or so. At first, I thought it was a dog or fox because the animal was following me at a steady pace, but keeping really quiet and off the trail just inside the cover of the trees. This made me uneasy because there had been reports of rabid koi dogs in the area. So I quickened my pace a little, keeping track of the animal, expecting it would lose interest and meander off somewhere else into the woods. But it didn't. Instead, it seemed to quicken its pace, and its sounds became louder, like it was kicking up leaves and snow and breaking not twigs, but branches. I thought, this is some weirdo stalking me, yet the weirdo still didn't show his face, but kept pace with me. My ears tried to place where it was in the black woods, but the lack of light meant I was restricted to sound only. I guess I was afraid to run from him, fearing he would most certainly catch up with me. So I decided to pretend I was unaware. At this point, I had about one-third of the trail left to cover, and my follower was keeping pace with me. Walking like a fairly large person through the woods, judging by the sounds I was hearing, his distance was approximately 15 to 20 feet away from me, but I still hadn't seen anything. Up until now, I had just been looking out of the corner of my eyes, not willing, I guess, to turn my head for fear of what I might see. I admit it. And when I did turn my head, just slightly, as we kept walking together, what I saw really kind of changed my perception of reality. I saw a blocky, dark, and very tall moving object walking its way through the woods next to me. I could hear breathing. I could see it moving, but I could not tell you what it was. I could feel my brain growing new dendrites, trying to handle the reality of what I was seeing. It couldn't, though not really. In my mind, I was thinking, well, it's not human, though it must be some kind of spirit or something. I really did not know what it was, and until a few months ago, when I discovered Bigfoot pages online, I guess I would not admit to myself what I had experienced. But I revisited the experience recently and let myself kind of relive it and remembered it in full. I do not know if this being was a Bigfoot. There was no smell. I did not see a face or arms, only the bulky body and occasional shadows that looked like legs walking. I was too scared to look closely, really. 
We walked together the rest of the way through the woods, and I was most scared when coming to the edge of the woods. I felt like if it was going to grab me, it would be there. I was also scared of seeing it, I think. So, at the very edge of the woods, I bolted. I ran about three-eighths of a mile, and my feet never touched the ground. I ran into the nearest fast food place and caught my breath. Whatever was following me never came out of the woods, and I have never told anyone this story until now, because the idea of a ten-foot monster following you through the woods sounds like a kid's nightmare. Before this incident, a strange thing happened to me on another winter night walk near the college grounds, at the opposite end of the track. It was about two in the morning, snowing below freezing. I had walked up a small hill topped with forests across a street behind the track and was looking at the view when I heard a very frightening, sort of guttural, low, moaning or growling noise, which seemed to come from a small house situated about a hundred yards away and sort of near the woods. The noises were very loud, and at first I thought someone in the house had a stereo on and was playing a song at a low speed, but there was no music and no intelligible words or structure. The sounds were very scary. They began as I walked up the hill and stopped as I was leaving. And did I leave, after listening to these strange and almost eerie noises for about three minutes. They really made my skin crawl, very low and very bestial. I almost think the sounds I heard surpassed being tailed in the woods in terms of strangeness. They were even more completely off my map than hearing a large, dark shape following me through the woods. I've been around bears while camping, so at least I have some reference point. The vocalizations I heard were so unusual, they seemed like special effects. It was mostly pines and mixed hardwoods. A creek flowed through the acreage. The road my follower and I were on was close to a trail that loosely followed the creek. The woods was an experimental forest on the sunny college at Cortland campus. There was a small herd of managed deer and pens of wild birds and other animals there as well. On to the next one. In Hamilton County in New York, we were just going to sleep when my wife said there was a raccoon looking in a small window. That window was at least five feet from the ground, and there were no trees or bushes nearby. She persisted so much that I rolled over fast and saw something looking through the glass, and it was no way a raccoon. The next morning, we went out looking. There was a small clearing, also was a small stream, about two feet wide, seven or eight inches deep. We found a heel print by the edge of the stream, about eight inches wide. By the way, this happened in the Adirondack Mount at nighttime. 11 p.m., clear and muggy. At the edge of the lake was more bushes. Bias was a forest about 25 yards away. Another story was of this couple who were at the same lake, and their daughter had to go to the outhouse. She was gone long enough to concern them. They called out, What are you doing? She replied, I'm feeding the bear my crackers. The father took a flashlight and went to get her and saw a furry thing bending over, picking up the crackers and eating them. He quickly got his girl and they slept nervously all night. On to the next one. In Dutchess County in New York, a Bigfoot was seen on three occasions by a young man. The Bigfoot was eight to nine feet tall, and seen while the witness was snowballing, the same young man eventually had three sightings of Bigfoot. On the third sighting, the Bigfoot was eight to nine feet tall and seen in a lover's lane. What was the young man doing in a lover's lane on his own, or was he? The Bigfoot was carrying a four-foot-long stick when it approached the pickup while the witness was Bigfoot hunting. On to the next one. 
Omaha and Ponca. Both the Omaha and Ponca tribes had migrated to the plains along the upper Missouri River after having been pushed out of the Ohio River Valley by tribesmen among the Iroquois in the late 1600s. Today, many Omaha currently reside over on the over 307-mile Omaha Indian Reservation in northern Nebraska and western Iowa, yet most of the Ponca live in Nebraska and Oklahoma. From the year 1888, in the very first issue of the Journal of American Folklore is an article written by J. Owen Dorsey titled Abstracts of Omaha and Ponca Myth. There are curious details to what is referred to as Thundermen. According to the story, Thundermen reside in a cave at the top of a mountain in what the story describes as a dense cedar forest. The story also mentions they preyed on the human race. The story says that the Thunder Men were originally supposed to, according to the story, eat animals instead of people. They would not stop eating people, so they were then banished, as the story describes, from this earth, sending them into the upper world, where they serve men by sending cooling rains and storms in hot weather. Could this be yet another description of the Sasquatch and Bigfoot creatures having the ability to change the weather. Also found in Volume 1, Number 3, 1888 edition of the Journal of American Folklore, another article titled, Fairies, Dwarfs, and Giants. In the article, it is written by the author, the writer has found no trace of a belief in fairies among those Thuyan tribes whose customs and mythology he has been studying. But the Omaha and Ponca tell of a race of little people, the Gudazi or Nikashigama Tanaha, wild people who can produce wounds under and without breaking the skin. They also have stories of giants and beings with very large heads. The latter reside in the forest and cause a peculiar form of insanity to seize unfortunate native men whom they encounter one at a time, away from the people and lodges. The little wild people, which may have caused bruises, may actually be in fact Bigfoot or Sasquatch young. That, like all animals, would have to grow from a smaller size and eventually breed and bear their own young. It makes sense of such stories of little wild people as told among the Omaha and Ponca tribes, and also the concept that a similarly described creature causes men who encounter it to lose their mind. Maybe because it is a reality that people just weren't told enough about. How can we accept it if we were told what we had encountered just doesn't exist? How can we accept what it is? Kauaikiotl. They reside along the central region of British Columbia's coast as well as the northern end of Vancouver Island, from an article written by Franz Bose, once again the father of American anthropology, in the April-June 1888 Volume 1, Number 1 issue of the Journal of American Folklore titled On Certain Songs and Dances of the Kauai Kotal of British Columbia, it is mentioned, in the winter of 1886-87, to the writer visited the coast tribes of British Columbia in order to study their language and customs. In the article, there is a reference to what the Kauai Kuddle tribe on Vancouver Island had referred to at the time as Cannibal's and Cannibal's wife. She is also referred to as the daughter of the mountain spirit. These are probably some of the oldest known tales of what most Bigfoot Sasquatch researchers as well as novices nowadays refer to as Bukwa. There's also the tribal observation of these creatures believed to be once human who were transformed by ritual, being absent from the area of the Kwai Kuodal tribe, the northern end of Vancouver Island, during the five coldest months of winters. Could this be a tribal observation based on the creature's possible winter migration? 
to other warmer areas during the coldest months of winter. The southern end of Vancouver Island, which is opposite from where the Kauai Kudal primarily reside, the southeastern part of the island, including the adjoining Gulf Islands, a small archipelago just off the southeastern coast, enjoys Canada's mildest climate and frequently reports the country's warmest winter temperatures. It appears that observation also corroborates the claim among the Kauai Kudal that these creatures may have been absent from the north end of the island because they might have favored the climate on the southern portion of the same island in the winter. The Journal of American Folklore then mentions some of the strange traditions to the tribal ritual of actually feeding this race of strange beings. During one tradition among the Kauai Kudal, a dish of whatever meal is served to the cannibals by young boys. A number of young boys must watch that this law is obeyed. He has the privilege to take whatever he likes. He is in reference to the cannibal. The article makes the strong suggestion that the cannibal is given the privilege of taking more than just the delivered meal. This is a rather strong suggestion. Bookwas is defined nowadays as a wild man, not a cannibal. The subject seems to be one in which, sadly, the readers have lost touch with. The change in stories over the years seems to be as dramatic as the name change for the same described creature. The name Bookwas has more than likely been shortened from the original name. Both male and female versions of the creature can be seen adorned on ceremonial masks and totem poles which show a number of ape-like features. Such features include a prominent brow ridge, a wide mouth with human-like teeth, a flat nose with nostrils pointing downward. These features are still described in recent eyewitness reports of Bigfoot and Sasquatch. Some stories mentioned in the 1989 James Wallace book titled Kauai Kudal Legends give Bukwath the ability to drain the strength from his potential victims, and he is sometimes described as having a basket which he uses in order to store those he's gathered with relative ease. Bukwath is depicted as a creature which can cover steep, long distances in a rather short amount of time. Some of those who may have been captured and escaped may not even be able to realize or recall what had actually happened or what had been carrying them uphill over such a long distance and in such a quick amount of time. More modern, cool names given in reference to what appears to be Bigfoot Sasquatch by Kauai Kuro school schoolchildren in the book is actually Big Figure. What is most surprising is that the Kauai Kuro tribe distinguish the female identity of this Bigfoot-like creature as separate from male. The name of the cannibal's wife was more than likely changed over the course of about 100 years of time. Sonakwa is sometimes depicted on totem poles as having pursed lips, which is suggestive of howls or whistles, obvious sagging breaths, a brow ridge above the eyes, and outstretched arms with obvious hands. On some totem poles, she can even be seen holding her baby. She is described as being nocturnal and is sometimes also depicted or described as having a basket she uses in abducting children, quite possibly to replace her own children who may have died. According to Professor Meldrum, this is what her outstretched arms on some of these totem poles seems to suggest. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on this channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!